be honest, some of your uncertainty, knowing that you grapple with similar challenges to the ones that we face here. Um, I'm going to just turn things over to Professor Richard Summer, who's the Dean of the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design here at U of T. He's got a long history with the Hudson Yards Project because he's actually been involved in a number of studies um, of the site over the years. To close things off. I actually brought some slides, uh, not too many. Um, first, let me say uh, how interesting it was to see uh, the stage of the project is at now and how it's a little bit intimidating to be, uh, to be uh, responding to these types of uh, development. Um, Joe told me they were putting this event together a few weeks ago, and I reminded him that I had been involved um, over the last, I guess, actually 20 or 20, more than 20 years. Um, in, in various proposals for Hudson Yards. In fact, when I was a very green, very naive um, uh, recent, gra uh, recent graduate of architecture school uh, um, in, I think it was 1988, uh, I went to work for Cooper Robertson, who were the architects that, uh, well, Cooper was involved with XAC and design Battery Park City, and they were working for Olympia and York to do the um, proposal for the West Side. So I. Strangely, got thrown onto this project as the designer of six million square feet, and I had to go over to the west side and uh, survey the site, which basically over there at the time was mostly full of prostitutes and vagrants. Uh, although at night, we, even then, we were going over to the advanced for uh, diner uh, over in Chelsea, so there were things going on in Chelsea even then. Um, the interesting thing uh, about that project, of course, was we did end up making the proposal for six, six million square feet. I remember being up several nights finishing it and then going into Olympia New York, at Olympia New York's offices. Uh, and within six months, the market um, went to hell. Uh, and I actually went west. And I didn't return to the East Coast in the United States until 10 years later uh, when there was another cycle uh, along with the CCA competition looking at the site. And I was asked, uh, then in my capacity as a, um, as a professor and as an urban designer um, at, at Harvard's graduate school of design to do a study that was sponsored by the, um, well, the it was actually a study for the Hell's Kitchen Neighborhood Association, which was a, a series of residents that lived on the edge of Chelsea and in, in, in Hell's Kitchen. Can we get the slides up? Is anyone up there? Where they leave? Oh, it's on here. So, so, um, so I had a chance to kind of revisit the site, um, and then I uh, so I did this uh, project of actually going to show, and then I worked on it again uh, around the time of the football stadium proposal because Vernado, one of the developers, eventually um, um, bid for the site, uh, sponsored a competition through the um, Newman Institute, which is a real estate institute in New York, and asked people at various universities to team up with New York architects and zoning lawyers and look at uh, how to untie this, the, the site. So um, I've had this kind of funny relationship to it. And uh, Jay went through a number of these issues, but I, I, I'm going to go into slightly very, very quickly. Uh, looking at, that's what the yards were in the, in the mid-century. Uh, it's very important to understand that there was a highway on the west side that came down. So you see how locked up this site was. It's not only the yards but all of the tunnels and what we call the spaghetti that have to do with the Port Authority. So while people want to call this Midtown West, it's a very, very difficult site to ameliorate in terms of infrastructure. So, uh, and the other interesting part of the history of the site is that originally the J Jacob Javits Center was supposed to be further north. And that area you're seeing in yellow there is a, a zone that is uh, locked in, and it's, it, uh, was locked in by Councillor Bella Absolute in the 70s and it's all um, tenement housing that is rent controlled uh, in order to let people who work in the hotels, et cetera, live there. So there's a kind of, this site was a void between Chelsea and this other area. So what's interesting is, as, uh, as, um, as was already talked about, one of, the, one of the issues with unlocking this site really is the issue of mass transit. And when I did the study with others for, for um, the Newman Institute, we all did these beautiful schemes, you know, architects trying to kind of out to each other. We went and we had an all-day symposium, and all the people from the city sat there with the developers and argued about who was going to pay for the, the, the subway. They didn't, I, frankly, I don't even think they looked at the schemes. Um, and that was what was going on in, uh, I guess, 2005, 2007. So, uh, that is one of the keys to unlocking the site, which I think is going to make this project finally happen. 
But uh, earlier on, this is about 12 or 13 years ago, this is uh, a study that I did. Um, it's going to look very crude compared to what you've seen, which even before they rezone the site, what you're seeing in white there is what's buildable, what was buildable in the late 90s according to as of right zoning. So the site was already, you know, flush with buildable space even under the existing zoning. Uh, and what I ended up proposing, um, and I still think it's a, a, an important way to think, and I think it's an important way for us to think in Toronto. Um, so my question for the end of it tonight is, are you thinking big enough yet? Or is New York thinking big enough? Because the proposal that uh, I was interested in making was to actually get rid of the Jacob Javits Center because uh, convention centers have a shelf life, and either move it to the platform or elsewhere, because that would unlock all of the Manhattan blocks. And one of the amazing aspects of the yard site is that, like a lot of the west side, it descends to the river. So with the development of the west side, so you see this site in relationship to Wall Street, in relationship to the UN, this is really a kind of, as has been pointed out, a regional resource, right? Uh, it's, it's tied into a lot of transit and a, a lot of dynamics. So one aspect to think about this site is what gets stacked on the yards, the second is, not only for the Hudson Yards, but for all the spaghetti and all the air rights that the Port Authority and uh, the Transit Authority's own, you, that, that actually could be leveraged to pay for all the public improvements, which is happening on the yards now. And this is a drawing that basically shows not only development on the yard site, but wrapping around all the spaghetti, a kind of proscenium of uh, commercial development that ultimately, because this project was for the community, was going to pay for a new, what we call the Neapolitan, um, uh, you know, kind of plural uh, development of residential, uh, commercial, and uh, retail development, where the urbanism of Manhattan actually happens, which is on the streets. So you see this kind of uh, yellow, uh, uh, brown, and, uh, and, and pink development. So uh, ultimately, this was a, th these studies were not, um, for a developer, or, for, or actually for real in a sense, but what they were trying to do was to envision the entire area, including the yards, as part of a kind of way of thinking very big about the future of New York, so that the interests of people who were really trying to protect the, their, their, their rights and the kind of residential aspect there, but also development who wanted to come west, and the, the, the problem of unlocking the yards could be all put together. And I think, I think this project is actually reaching a piece of that, but I think when we're looking at very difficult parts of cities like this, where, where there is a, a barrier to entry in developing them because of the cost of building a jet, for example, or the cost of ameliorating the effects of infrastructure, there needs to be a very big public private discussion and also a kind of plan that deals with the, the competing interests of all the constituencies. And uh, I think you see that model here, but I think uh, with regards to the waterfront and large sites like this, we could be actually looking at even larger territories. So, uh, or, or, or kind of larger uh, uh, sets of relationships. Um, some, some of what we're looking at here uh, will happen, but uh, the, of course the key, uh, the key proposal here was to, was to get rid of the um, convention center that in the historical photograph, as, it, it, as I indicated, um, or the historical map, was actually placed here in some ways because at the time the land wasn't valuable and, um, uh, and now it is. So uh, there's a question as to whether what uses make sense uh, in a site like this now. So um, I think I'll, I'll close it there. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the two speakers for, uh, for, um, for just an, an incredible uh, insight into, I think, a, a project that uh, I, I think there were projects for this that probably preceded even the Olympian Europe one in the, uh, in the 80s. Uh, it's been sitting there uh, that long, but certainly there have been five or six proposals. And this, the, I think also the extremely interesting point has to do with this idea of development cycles that, you know, um, I think you said that industrial and residential ones t tend to uh, follow the market very well, but the retail and the commercial uh, often are out of sync. And I think that's uh, part of the history of this site as well, is that there have been some very uh, great efforts, but they often hit the wrong arc. Uh, and uh, so we'll see, we'll see what happens now. So thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for a wonderful evening. Our, 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 our
marvelous panelists, our wonderful moderator, and uh, stay tuned. Well, there will be another piece of